As we honor and celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., there is one person committed to his legacy, the man who happens to be born into it, his namesake, Martin Luther King III and his wife, Andrea Water King, joining us this morning. So we all know that this birthday celebration, it has been on the federal calendar for years. And some people say it comes around every year, but none other than you two to describe why this legacy and celebration is so special. Let, let, let me begin, first of all, by thanking you for the opportunity to, uh, for us to be able to share today during this holiday period. I might add that one of the special uniquenesses of this particular holiday, as you stated, it falls every year on the third uh, Monday of January. Uh, this year, it actually is dad's actual birthday, January 15th. Um, and so many years it's on the 20th, the 21st, but every seven or so years it falls on the actual holiday. Also, this is the 95th. Dad would have been 95 years old. So it's a critical point. And I think the real challenge and question is, how do we really work to achieve the dream when we are probably at one of the most divided points uh, in the history of our lives, certainly in my life, in my 66 years, I don't know that we have ever been as divided as, as we are right now as a nation. And Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King always uh, wanted to bring our nation together. So it is wonderful that we have an opportunity to observe, not celebrate. Celebration will come at one time. In fact, I say we celebrated in 1983 when Ronald Reagan signed the bill. We celebrated in 86 when actually the first federal holiday was observed. Uh, we may have celebrated certainly in 2009, there have been when President Obama was sworn in uh, during that time, during the holiday. So there have been moments for celebration, but there really are opportunities for challenge. My mom always talked about the King holiday as a day on, not a day off. Uh, we often think about taking off on holidays, but we must stay engaged. We must stay on the battlefield. We must work to make sure voting rights are protected and preserved, make sure democracy is preserved, and to create uh, the opportunity for poverty, racism, and militarism or violence to be eradicated from our society, which is what one of the things my dad wanted to do. I remember growing up and being in service organizations, starting as early as elementary school, we were always taught it was ingrained in us. It is a day on and not a day off, even if you have the day off of school or work for your parents. Now, I wanna jump back to something really crucial that you said, because it goes in line with the theme of this year, Mr. King, you talked about just the division in our country and the state of politics. You all are still carrying on your father's message of nonviolence. Tell us about the theme this year and what you want people to know about executing the dream even now. I think that the, the biggest um, challenge that we face and one of the things that we are very passionate about is for people not to idolize um, Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King, but to live up to their ideals. I think that obviously when Dr. King was on the, the Lincoln Memorial, he talked about his four children. He literally, of course, meant his four children, but in a very real sense, we are all heirs and, um, and responsible in a very real sense to um, realize the dream. And we all have a unique role and a part in doing so. Um, so one of our biggest, um, obviously we continue to work on the eradication of the triple evils of racism and bigotry, violence and poverty. And we believe it's through um, um, building up peace, justice and equity. Um, but also we are very passionate in letting people, particularly since we have a 15 year old daughter to see themselves as part of the dream, to see themselves as part of the legacy and to do their part to really make um, the beloved community a reality for all of us. One of the most simple ways that that can be done is through service. And that's one of the things that we are um, kicking off this year is a five-year campaign to really focus on service for everyone, but in particular for youth, to really be a part of unifying, to be a part of building the world in which they want to inherit um, for their generations and for future generations beyond them. 
I looked at the itinerary on the King Center's website and I loved how many youth focus and youth center events we had because they are indeed the future. And we may think of it as Dr. King's legacy being so far removed. They may say like, oh, this is in the history books. That was so long ago. But we're seeing some of those same fights happen right now here today. Mr. King, what do you think your father would say about the state of the nation on his 95th birthday? <laughs> I, I figure, I believe that number one, he would uh, try to characterize things in an up, <clears throat> uplifting way, although it is a very difficult set of circumstances for many in communities. Uh, violence is at epidemic levels, although in our city, it is stating that crime has gone down. But when we look at the nation uh, and the world, the violence is, is really at unacceptable levels and somehow humankind has got to become more humane. We are being, in a not a, we're not operating in a humane fashion. I think he'd be very concerned uh, about uh, the, 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 the lack of, of you, I mean, the, the fact that racism um, is at an all time high, uh, whether it's racism in the African American, against African Americans or against uh, uh, Latino and Hispanic Americans or against uh, anti-Semitism in our Jewish community uh, or racism against uh, uh, Islamic community. And then, you know, hatred among communities as well. Uh, hatred as it relates to the LBGTQIA community. And the list goes on and on. He'd be so concerned, but he'd be laserly focused on how do we put systems in place to reduce and create the best nation and the best world that we can so that all of God's children can propel. Um, there's so much here and it's very difficult to really uh, quantify it into one simple answer. Uh, he always believed that we must learn nonviolence or we might face non-existence. And tragically, it feels like in some areas we might be at that point. That's when humanity has to step in. And I think that we see a lot of young people engaged uh, in some efforts uh, around our nation and, and really around the world. People are crying out for something different and new, something authentic. And we have to create the opportunity for that authenticity to emerge, and it ultimately will create a better nation and world. There are certain parts of Dr. King's legacy that feel heartbreaking to people who can recall his speeches and you may watch them online. You say, well, man, there are still certain parts of the dream that have not been realized and we still have so far to go. But let's talk about how far we've come from both of you. Tell me from your perspective, what part of his dream do you think has been fulfilled in a way that we can quantify and say we are making great strides? Hmm. That's a very good question because I do think that, um, and I will circle back around to that, but, and we also though are in a, in a very real sense in a point of time in history of when um, oppression is being legislated. Um, you know, I think that I, I worked for many years for Reverend C.T. Vivian here um, in, a, in Atlanta and we monitored hate groups and hate crimes. And to really see that a lot of the rhetoric that we were researching and organizing um, around in the 90s is literally being legislated to today is alarming. But one of the things um, which we've always taught our daughter since the time she was little is I'll always look for the helpers. Um, and we now have a generation that I believe and know within every fiber of my, my being will be one of the greatest generations that our country um, has seen. And I think that each and every young person that we have, each and every person that every day is doing something to, to eliminate the, the triple evils of racism and bigotry, to eliminate the um, poverty and violence. Everyone that's standing for peace, for justice, for um, equity, every single one of those people are um, evidence of the, the, um, the power and the continuation of the dream and the message of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. Um, Mrs. King talked about during her lifetime that you know freedom is never really won. It has to be um, gained and won in each generation. 
And so every day we see people feeding the flames of peace and, and justice and equity. We have more women elected into office um, than we had at, during the beginning of the civil rights movement. We have people of color. You know, we have a true multicultural um, society um, at our best in which we, we honor um, the diversity. So certainly there is a lot of work that is ahead of us, but yes, there are, there are things and um, there, have, there are gains that have been made. And now it's up to each one of us to continue to, to build and be a part of realizing the dream. And Mr. King, what would you say? Well, I would say uh, just as well, if we look at individual progress, it is phenomenal. Um, there are you know, African-American billionaires. Uh, we, we know of at least 10. There are probably some others that are not uh, publicly known, but they exist. Uh, there are CEOs of major corporations, businesses that are very successful. Uh, my concern, is that masses of people are not, the op opportunity and availability for masses has not yet uh, kicked in, in gear. You know, you still have people losing houses every day uh, or every week or every month. You still have people who don't have health care. Um, you still have people who don't have a job and that's the masses. So individuals have made great strides in a number of areas. Uh, we've not yet achieved, or the, we're not at the mark where we need to be or where we'd like to be, but there have been strides made. Uh, I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is ec economic in income and inequality. For example, the average white family in America still has almost $200,000 uh, available or saved up. The average black family is less than 15,000 in 2000. Uh, and in 2024, uh, you know, what does that mean? That means we have a lot of work to do to create and close that gap. Um, that means we've got to figure out how do we create the climate for people turning to each other and not a climate where people are turning on each other. Uh, when people become frustrated and angry, uh, it manifests sometimes at a level of violence and discourse that is unacceptable. So we got to create a different climate so that everyone can lift themselves up and achieve their dreams. And what I appreciate about this moment is that in each response, you both always took the opportunity to highlight the work and the legacy also on this day of Coretta Scott King. And we know recently her name has been in the media following comments by actor Jonathan Majors mentioning her on several occasions throughout his most recent court proceedings. Your sister, Dr. Bernice King, took the opportunity to have a response to that. Even as we talk about your father, what do you wanna say about your mother and how you want her held as we remember your father's legacy as well? So I would say first that my father's uh, memory, the work that he did if it had not been for my mother, I'm not sure that he would still be seen in the way that he is because uh, it's, when you think about it, uh, dad was killed April 4th of 1968. By June, mid-June mid of 1968, the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change was operating. That's two months. To, be, to build a concept and a vision that probably took five years or more but it was already in place. She began that, that institution with friends and family. Uh, she also was very much a part of creating a consciousness for a national holiday, visiting every United States Senator and many Congress persons. And while it took uh, a number of years to get the holiday, it is institutionalized now. Uh, the list goes on and on. Of course, mother was involved in the peace movement and brought dad to the peace movement. Uh, our daughter uh, just recently released a book uh, that is in honor of her grandparents called we, Dr we Dream a World. And in that book, she talks about her vision uh, for what uh, we need to do to really make the dream become a reality for, for all people. And yet 
uh, the fact of the matter is all of this, you know, when you talk about the, the historical documents, it was my mother who actually kept and maintained uh, those documents and through the center and other uh, avenues it has been released to the public. So my mother was also, I should say, involved with dad all along the way from day one. Uh, whether it was in Montgomery or, or whether it was in Washington, D.C. Uh, she joined him on many demonstrations, but every day he was conferring with her when he also made some of the critical decisions that he had to make. So I think that we have this, this holiday that we all observe because directly, it would, there were many other people, but certainly Coretta Scott King. I think it's fair to say that without Coretta Scott King, there wouldn't be a Martin Luther King Jr. as we know it while he was alive um, and certainly even after his death. So if, if anything, maybe even having her name in conversations will um, turn a lot of young people to really truly discover who um, and what she, she did from before she met Martin Luther King Jr. to after she met um, Martin Luther King Jr. And that's what I love about the conversation. The education mm -hmm. is there, and you all are not shying away from the subject matter, saying if we're going to put her name in the conversation, we're going to do it properly and give her the accolade she is so deserving of as well. So we thank you all for being here and for giving us your time to honor and commemorate this momentous occasion. And happy birthday, Dr. Mm -hmm. King. Take care, you all.